Hi, I'm Andrew Rodriguez, and welcome to Psycho Bible. In my last video, I analyzed the representations of sexuality in the documentary Tiger King on Netflix. And there's another documentary on Netflix that I watched recently that I wanted to analyze as well uh, regarding the representation of sexuality. And that was Killer Inside, The Mind of Aaron Hernandez. So if you're not familiar, Aaron Hernandez was a tight end for the New England Patriots from 2010 to 2013. Uh, his career was short-lived when he was arrested for the murder of Odin Lloyd, a semi-pro football player who became friends with Aaron when he began dating the sister of Aaron's fiancé. Hernandez was also suspected of killing Daniel de Abreu and Safiro Furtado in 2012. He was convicted of Owen Lloyd's murder in 2015, but acquitted of the other charges in 2017. And during the second trial, rumors of his involvement in homosexuality surfaced. And shortly after the acquittal, he hung himself in his prison cell. Now, I'm no sports fan, so if it weren't for the trial, I probably would not have ever heard of Aaron Hernandez. Uh, but I do remember hearing about this whole case from the beginning. And when the news came out of him being arrested, and like, arrested for murder, and I'm like, this dude was a, an NFL player? Like, what kind of people are they letting into their teams? That was my, my initial impression. So I paid attention to the updates, and then when, when he killed himself, that was a shock to so many of us. And then we heard about the rumors of his uh, homosexual liaisons, or whether they were true or not, who knows, but... Uh, it sure seems like that was what was the final straw for him. So studying his life and the trial, uh, we can learn quite a lot uh, about psychology and um, some aspects of the football world and uh, just sexuality. There's just so many avenues you can go in. So I'm going to focus this primarily just to the discussion of his sexuality. First, just a bit of critique about the documentary itself. It's three episodes. It plays more like a true crime court TV special. For something with mind in the title, I was hoping for more of a psychological profile, uh, but they really do not go into his behavior and psychology as much as I would prefer. You, you can find out more about his history of violence, drug use, and paranoia on his Wikipedia page. So, there was a lot left unsaid. Uh, they don't interview hardly any of his family, not even his brother DJ, who had written a book, The Truth About Aaron, My Journey to Understand My Brother. They barely mention the book, not even the title. Uh, no psychologist is interviewed to give a profile of Aaron based on what we know or have heard. And of course, Aaron is dead, so there's a lot of hearsay that many viewers will likely reject by default. So... I'm not going to do a very thorough expose and an investigation into his life. I'm sticking to the information provided by the documentary and what the message was that they were trying to convey. And so my critique will mostly be based on that, uh, even though I looked up a little bit more about him online. So like I said, the part of his story and the documentary of particular interest to me is his sexuality. One of Aaron's closest friends from school, Dennis Sansusi, claims he and Aaron had an on-and-off sexual relationship from grades 7 to 11. He said Aaron was sexually active with many guys, not just himself. So right away, we see the filmmakers attempt to steer us into a narrative that Aaron was a closeted homosexual man his whole life. His adolescent friend Dennis testifies to it. One of his lawyers, who happened to be gay identified himself, stated that Aaron divulged his homosexuality to him, and Aaron asked this lawyer if he believed people were born gay. And of course, this, this gay lawyer said yes. So you start to see the narrative they're creating. And then they choose to include interviews from Ryan O'Callaghan, a former teammate of Aaron's in college, not because he was privy to much about Aaron, but to reinforce the narrative of the difficulty of being a man born gay but working in the anti-gay world of sports. O'Callaghan said he himself had a gay identity since high school, but he suppressed it. He described playing football as his beard, 
a term in the gay culture or community for anything used to hide one's homosexuality. Most often it's referring to a female relationship, which is what he directly asserted Shina Jenkins, Aaron's fiance, was. He suggests, and it sure seems the documentary wants us to believe, that Shiana was just a beard and Aaron was living a lie his whole life. So she's like his fake fiancé, his fake love interest, and uh, he's really attracted to men. At least that's, that's the assertion that O'Callaghan is making. So here's the question. Is it as simple as that? He was born gay and he was tormented by the expectations and pressures to fit into a masculine stereotype to lay people that that seems adequate but when you work in this field you understand that there's much more nuance the pro lgbt ideologues want to take this narrative to place the blame for all of the disproportionate mental illness suicidality and substance abuse in the gay community on homophobia in society at large However, if you are familiar with systems theory, like family systems theory, you would know that early in life, and this would have to begin early if the individual believes he was, if he always felt this way, the immediate family has the greatest influence on the individual, not society. So what do we learn about Aaron's immediate family and his early life? Well, not enough for me, but we are given some clues. He grew up middle class in a suburban area. His father, Dennis, was a local football hero known as the King. Uh, I guess he was also known for kind of acting like the King, and so he, he was very much authoritarian. There's his mom, Terry, and his older brother, DJ. In his book, DJ details how alcoholic and violent their father was. The parents fought daily, and it was really violent fighting, it was just arguing. He describes one incident of dad bashing mom's head against the sink. Also in the book, DJ tells the story of a time when Aaron was very young. Inspired by his female cousins, he said he wanted to do cheerleading, and dad squashed that right away. Of course, of all the things in DJ's book, the documentary made sure to mention that one. Now, does this mean that he was born gay? No, that... That says nothing except how close he was to his cousins and his innocence. If he was really little, like say, age six or five, it doesn't say in the documentary how old he was when he made that that statement. Um, if this was prior to school age, he was still developing his awareness of gender norms. He could have been impressed by the bright colors and the acrobatics, or the opportunity to be around girls. Maybe if he was getting a little older. <laughs> Even if it was just his cousins whom he loved, it could have just been something he wanted to do with his cousins. He really loved them. Interest in some form of gender nonconformity might be a sign of later same-sex attraction, but it's not sufficient. What's more important is how the parents react to any type of gender nonconformity. If it's with shaming, it represses the interest, driving it underground. So there's a little bit of a clue here. Um, about Aaron himself, that he might have had some uh, softer sensibilities, but that was definitely discouraged in his home. At school, his friend Dennis described Aaron as cheerful and a jokester who was self-deprecating. Uh, he didn't. He wasn't like a bully. He wasn't uh, just a tough guy all the time. He seemed like he was a bit of a goofball. And through all the footage we see, he comes off as affable if not even a bit intellectually and emotionally stunted. As an adult, he seems to have the mind of a, a child in some ways. He's got two major factors that could explain this. The trauma from the domestic violence growing up in, in that home, and his multiple brain injuries. Like Those brain injuries were beginning in, in his high school years playing football. And so that definitely is going to have an effect on, on his intelligence and his emotional volatility. Now, some of the interviewees state that Aaron was very close to his dad, saying he would mirror him. But they also mention how strict dad was, and we learn how violent he was to their mother. 
His friend Dennis claims that Aaron was in denial of his homosexuality because he was an athlete and they feared getting caught. He said both their dads were homophobic. Aaron knew to be a different person around his dad. They both could turn it on and off. This indicates a fear of incurring dad's wrath. A fear he developed maybe even just vicariously through witnessing abuse against his mother. Or a fear that he developed firsthand from dad abusing him. We, we're not given a whole lot of detail about dad abusing the sons, just the mom. But it's possible. It also indicates the ability to uh, live with, with a persona. To turn it on and off. To be one way around, around one group and another way around someone else. So that's really important, especially as you get to know guys uh, with same-sex attraction. They they often wear different hats, depending on the uh, their environment growing up. So if you're familiar with the developmental model for explaining homosexuality in males, you may be picking up on some things. One of the core concepts is the classic triadic relationship. A sensitive boy, uh, a distant or rejecting father, but what we don't see evidence of in the documentary is the over-involved, nurturing mother. Instead, we see signs that his relationship with his mother is very conflicted. Uh, in the recordings, she comes off as very dismissive of his emotions. Uh, he brings up ways she hurt him in childhood, and she minimizes. When he was 16, his dad died suddenly during a hernia surgery. Almost immediately afterward, Terry, his mom, has an affair with her cousin Tanya's husband. And he moves in. Now that's a major dysfunction. Just literally like a month or two after your dad dies, now a new man is living there. And he's the husband of your cousin, whom you love. Uh, and your mom's having an affair with him. Just, just, that was a bit much. It's entirely possible she was having an affair for years. Or affairs. Who knows? So this is a turning point for Aaron. He moves out. You know, he's just a teenager. He moves out and he moves into his cousin Tanya's place. So uh, the cousin whose husband is now with his mom. And Tanya becomes like a new mother. So he was very close to Tanya. You hear recordings of him talking with Tanya and uh, saying he can't live without her. Uh, and of course, during his trial, she's dying of cancer, uh, and she died during the second trial. I think that was also a major contributor, not just the revelation of his homosexuality, but the death of his emotional, his second mom, uh, was likely a major contributor to his decision to kill himself. Anyway, so what we see here is indication of childhood attachment loss a malattunement with his mother that reached its peak. His dad dies, now he's left with his mom. And you'd think, well, dad was so violent toward mom growing up, you'd think he would have been close to his mom. But apparently the, both parents fought, but of course dad was a force of nature, and you couldn't just fight against him easily. So, um, but apparently mom was just not as close to, to Aaron as, as he, he wanted, and, and she betrayed him in some ways. And so, he, he bailed. Uh, previously, his friend Dennis said that he and Aaron were engaging in homosexual behavior up until 11th grade. This shift seems to coincide with the death of his father. And it seems to fit the timeline of when he started dating Shayana. It could be that his dad's sudden death and his mom's perceived betrayal of dad's memory could have been a wake-up call for Aaron to honor his dad's legacy. Uh, to forsake the homosexual relations and and just hyper focus on football and uh, heterosexual relationships, or his one uh, relationship with Shayana. However, if he was exclusively same sex attracted, then it's not just a switch he can turn off and on, and and then have opposite sex attractions. Well, of course not. You may say Shayana is just his beard as the documentary was kind of insinuating. But what the documentary doesn't mention was that just recently before his arrest, apparently Aaron was cheating on Shayana with other women. 
If he's exclusively same-sex attracted, and Shiana is just his cover, his fake girlfriend or fiancé, and he cheats, it's not going to be with another woman. So if he's cheating and he's, uh, his girlfriend is really just his fake one, he'd be cheating on her with other guys. But that's not what we find out. So I don't buy that he was exclusively same-sex attracted and he was just behaving heterosexually as a cover. Or even as an attempt to straighten himself out. Some people think, well, if I can get a girlfriend, then that'll be my cure. Uh, I have no reason to doubt that his attraction to Shiana and other women was legitimate uh, or authentic. His homosexuality seems instead to indicate a compulsion rooted in trauma reenactment, as well as the other developmental factors already discussed. So before proceeding, let me give some explanation of the developmental model for homosexuality. Now, officially, the APA, the American Psychological Association, states that there is no evidence that homosexuality is biologically determined. So if you're stuck on the born gay myth, let it go. However, the APA also states that there are no known cause or sets of causes for homosexuality. The official answer, based on the quantitative research, is we do not know what causes same-sex attraction. However, those of us who have worked with individuals leaving homosexuality encounter some common trends, and there is some research support. So some of us are willing to go out on a limb and assert theories of etiology or causes for homosexuality. I usually explain it this way. There are many pathways or potential contributors to same-sex attraction, but you can boil them down to unmet developmental needs or an overt traumatic experience like abuse. The late Dr. Joseph Nicolosi, in his book Shame and Attachment Loss, The Practical Work of Reparative Therapy, identified several types of homosexuality based on the developmental phase at the root. Uh, the first two types fall into my typical developmental category. The key concern of the developmental model is security in one's gender identity. The reality is that we grow into our gender identity through an interaction of our environment, our biological development, uh, and completion of certain developmental challenges. The first task is separation individuation and then gender identity formation, but they also occur rather simultaneously. The first phase of child development, pretty much just in general, is the attachment phase. Uh, the uh, bond that a child has with, with its primary caregiver, which would be the mother in most cases. That, that enables a child to first get a sense of self uh, as our attachment starts as sort of symbiotic, we, we start off just so connected with mother, we don't know the difference between her and uh, the child doesn't know the difference between the mother and child. And so there's the first task is to, to separate and then individuate. And so with that secure attachment, with knowing that mom is there, she gives a sense of basic trust in the world. And then you start to realize, well, I'm a separate person from mom. And as the baby grows into like the terrible twos, has more of the ability to be mobile and explore his world, he begins to separate. But he mostly will be able to separate if mom is encouraging that separation, as well as she is available for when he needs to return, the rapprochement phase. So, uh, or just act. So there will be a cycle of in those twos of the child exploring and then returning back to home base and that happens if there's a secure attachment what we've come to see in guys with same-sex attraction is often an insecure attachment of some sort with the mother now this could happen for two major reasons either excessive engagement from the mother or a lack of engagement and these could be due to the mother's personality or her idiosyncrasies or unavoidable events like illness or death. So 
say if a baby gets sick right away after being born and is in an incubator for a while or uh, the mother's not able to touch the, the child, that can interfere with the attachment process. Uh, it'll, we, we need to find ways to mitigate that, of course. As well as the baby's natural temperament could be a factor in any malattunement. If the baby has like an easy temperament, that makes, it, that makes the attunement process easier. If the baby's very difficult or is very spirited, it can be difficult for the mom and baby to attune. So attunement is really important in forming that attachment bond. But what we see often in babies who have an insecure attachment is uh, the excessive engagement of the mother, where it exhaust the baby and he'll try to do things like gaze aversion, look away or pull away, but the mom just keeps engaging and just wants to cuddle and play or uh, keep soothing when the baby's had enough. And so when she persists in that, the baby has a bit of a shutdown and that's actually a form of dissociation. So it's a shutting down of the emotions. Okay. On the other hand, if the, the mom is not engaging enough or, or is completely oblivious, the baby will constantly be crying and pleading and trying to get the mom's attention. And when that is uh, ultimately fruitless, there will be an, also a shutdown, another form of dissociation. So the mother's role at this stage, or just in general, is to model and provide affect regulation. When the baby's in distress, mom is there, she's attentive, and helps the baby learn how to cope with negative emotions. But when you have a father that is also a force of nature, maybe perhaps this would be the case in Aaron's life, or both parents are engaged in violence together, the mom is simply unable to provide the soothing that she needs to. So that's something to consider when it comes to Aaron. Normatively, with the secure attachment, a baby is then able to assert himself as, an, as his own individual. Now this is true for both boys and girls. But for boys, there's the additional developmental task around the same age of gender identity, of now not just separating from mom as an individual and exploring his world, but also to separate from her and begin to identify with dad, to, so to form an, a, an attachment with the father. Of course, girls have to attach with dad, but it's going to mean something different for the boy because he is the same sex as the father, and so it has more significance for the boy at this age. So the second phase is the gender identity phase, and this has to be accomplished by about age three. So in addition to individuating from mom, boys have that additional task. Dad must be perceived as salient, I mean, worthwhile connecting to. And in order to be salient, the boy must perceive the dad as both strong and benevolent. Now the dad can potentially shame the boy through overt abuse or passive non-engagement with his son. And the boy needs engagement from the dad in order to separate from mom. It's not the boy's job to separate as much as it's the dad's job to call him forth and model to him what it means to be a male. And if the mom is like narcissistically maltuned, meaning that she's over-involved in order to meet her own emotional needs, then the dad really needs to engage that boy to draw him forth. And sometimes get in the way of mom if she's being too involved and... Uh, smothering. Now if the boy is facing malattunement with the dad, he also dissociates, especially if he was having some malattunement from with the mother. So he's already learned dissociation in some way. And so the any uh, insecure attachment with mom preps the boy to dissociate sooner with dad. So if dad is perceived as distant or rejecting, the boy already knows, unconsciously, to use this association. We call this uh, defensive detachment. He will disengage from or stop pursuing contact with dad in order to protect himself from more disappointment and hurt. This paves the way to a shame-based way of relating to others and a persistent sense of not belonging or being loved. This, I believe, is what's at the root of what so many guys who have same-sex attraction 
describe as always feeling different. And then when they are re when they reach adolescence, that difference becomes eroticized, and they then reinterpret their past experience by saying, "Oh, I was always gay." But really, I think it's that they can identify always feeling they don't belong in the world of men, and there's something different. There's something about the world of men that attracted them because they knew there was something within themselves that needed to be fulfilled still from that world. So attachment losses in the, the original attachment phase with mom and then the gender identity phase attaching to dad constitute what I often describe as uh, de unmet developmental needs as an explanation for one's same-sex attraction. But Nicolosi goes on to describe two other phases that uh, seem quite distinct from the prior two, the uh, pre-gender type. So after the gender identity formation stage, uh, from about ages 5 to 11, now we're in the erotic phase. And the boy's task here is bonding with siblings and peers. And this could really go wrong if they're traumatically hostile or rejecting. So now he doesn't feel like he fits into his peer group, especially the peer group of his same sex. If the developmental trauma occurred in this phase or later, it's considered post-Oedipal, or post-gender type homosexuality. And Nicolosi says about 20% of the cases he's seen have this type of homosexuality, and they present differently from those who have a pre-gender type. Uh, the guys in this category do not appear very effeminate. Uh, you wouldn't guess that they were gay or that they had same-sex attraction or they struggled with homosexuality at first glance. Uh, and there may be a wider a range of influences and contrib uh, contributors to their SSA, such as abuse or molestation. Uh, and even uh, peer rejection could be a major contributor at this point. Uh, they successfully or mostly completed the gender identity stage. So they don't appear effeminate uh, and may have genuine masculine development, yet they have an insecurity deep down and a compulsion for masculine affection as a coping mechanism for the insecurity. Uh, he, this, the guy in this category is more likely to have an early childhood or pubescent sexual experience that, that gets imprinted in his brain as a very ambivalent but also pleasurable experience. In his sexual fantasies, he is more drawn toward younger, softer males that represent his lost innocence, rather than idealized males that represent a, a masculine deficit. Like oftentimes the pre-gender type, they're more drawn to guys who uh, look strong and uh, ha have more hair and they, they look more stereotypically masculine because that represents to them what they're lacking. But the post-gender type may be the ones who are attracted to the guys who seem softer, seem maybe more effeminate. Uh, clinically, these guys have, in general, a better prognosis. They may also be more likely to have greater sexual attraction fluidity or previous attraction to females before trauma. Moving on from the erotic phase, as we go into later teen years and, and even young adulthood, we enter the social phase. And this is where the boy now uses social labels like gay or queer, uh, bi, uh, to explain the story of his life's experiences. Now he needs to figure out and solidify what his identity is, or I prefer to say self-label. And so this is really putting a name to... Uh, what he is, who he is, uh, how he's going to relate to others, what type of relationships he's going to engage in, and he, he takes some ownership over it. So it's sort of like the, the final uh, cap on it, uh, at least solidifying a, a LGBT identity. In my experience, working with guys with unwanted same-sex attraction, uh, they usually have both of those major potential causes, the unmet developmental needs and the uh, traumatic experience. But you can usually tell, as you get to know them, where the most significant contribution was. 
Um, I've had guys who do not fit that classic triadic relationship, or at least it doesn't seem like they come from that. Where they say, no, my dad wasn't uh, rejecting or distant. Uh, I had a good dad. We, when you talk about this uh, in any group among guys with same-sex attraction uh, or gay-identified guys, and there's going to be someone who's going to say, nope, that wasn't my experience. I had a great relationship with my dad. And, sure, my hunch is most likely that they, they'll be the ones who had some post-gender identity phase trauma that occurred. But for that trauma to really have the significance uh, to lead to same-sex attraction, there were likely some precursors. Because uh, I've known plenty of guys who had some sort of early same-sex same experience when they were uh, maybe around middle school age, and they didn't develop same-sex attraction. Now it's because they didn't have a gay gene, whereas the other ones did. No, I doubt it. Uh, we're never going to, I don't think we're ever find the gay gene, the elusive gay gene. Uh, more and more evidence shows that's not the case. But rather I would say that those who have that sort of uh, sex, childhood sexual experience or adolescent sexual experience and do develop same-sex attraction is because there is some contribution at the developmental stage that might have not been sufficient to cause same-sex attraction on its own, but that that uh, trauma, that abuse, that molestation, that uh, sexual experience later in life was what took them to the next level. So how does Aaron Hernandez fit this developmental model, given what we learned from the documentary? I think we see a case of blend of both pre-gender and post-gender type homosexuality. He certainly has some elements that fit the pre-gender type, in that there is a degree of insecure attachment with both parents. And yet he seems to have made enough of a bond with his dad, and his brother as well, you have to uh, factor that into his ability to identify with his gender, that he had some authentic security in his gender identity. We are told his dad was strict and abusive toward mom, but we're not told that he was abusive to the boys, or that Aaron viewed dad negatively. We're only told how he admired his dad. And his mother did not seem to be the narcissistic, over-involved type. And when I say narcissistic, I mean that she is uh, over-involved in order to meet her own emotional needs. Uh, not that she's just a greedy, selfish person. So the classic triadic relationship or the pre-gender type ap appears inadequate to explain his homosexual compulsivity. So my instinct was that there was some other factor that occurred in childhood, such as an early sexual experience. And wouldn't you know it, in the last episode, almost near the end, they mentioned that when Aaron was in prison, he revealed that when he was young, an older boy molested him. In DJ's book, he says that Aaron believed this was why he had same-sex attraction. And yet, does the documentary explore this revelation? Uh, gets barely a mention. Why? I would say because it flies in the face of the born gay narrative they were pushing. So they simply, they wanted to make sure they had the lawyer say that, yes, people are born gay, as if he's an expert. But here you have something that should be of significance, that he was molested by an older boy when he was a young child, and that does not get explored more. Because of the attachment lost with his mother and ambivalent relationship with his father, as far as we know, he was primed for the molestation to have a significant effect. And what gives that event the most impact is his anticipated shame if he were to disclose his experience to his parents. He knew how his dad would respond. So this repression drives a compulsion. Once you understand addiction, how addiction, is, especially sexual addiction, is driven by shame, it makes sense why he would go from sexual encounter to sexual encounter to sexual encounter. These weren't long-term homosexual relationships. They weren't romantic. They were uh, addictive in nature, it seems. He clearly had pre-gender type elements, but if the major contributor of his SSA was 
post-gender as I suspect, then there's no reason to question the authenticity of his attraction to Shayana or other women. He likely had attractions to both genders. But out of self-preservation, he isolated the same-sex attraction to secrecy and compulsivity. That likely all went underground when his father abruptly died in his late teens, at just the stage when he would be deciding how to self-label sexually. He's at that, that um, social stage in development. So perhaps out of a sense of loyalty to his late father, he decided to sanction his essay and commit to a heterosexual identity. It's entirely possible that his homosexual compulsions reemerged later in life, just as well as it's possible they subsided in indefinitely. We simply do not have evidence, at least not presented in the documentary, or that I've seen in just brief research, that he acted homosexually in adulthood. Uh, there was a rumor that the reason he killed Odin Lloyd was because Odin caught him acting out with another guy. That's possible, but it's just hearsay. So I hope this analysis of Killer Inside, the mind of Aaron Hernandez, was helpful to you. The main point, I, I hope you will question the narrative pushed onto you by the media, politicians, activists, and the education system. Born gay and cannot change is simplistic. It does not take into account the complexity of humans, let alone how a common sense understanding of natural law shows us that our bodies are designed, or evolved, if that's your preferred explanation, for heterosexuality and normative child development facilitates that in fulfillment. Opponents of therapy for unwanted same-sex attraction use the knee-jerk argument that our approaches are all based on quackery. And yet the truth is they are based on the integration of decades of research on things like attachment theory, trauma, addiction, and neuroplasticity. So I actually look forward to more profiles and investigative documentaries into the lives of people with same-sex attraction. Learning about their lives really just provides evidence of what those of us in this field have been observing and trying to explain to others for years. The deeper you look into their lives, the more evidence you get. So those are my thoughts on this particular documentary. Um, please join me in the comments section and we can uh, debate it more if you prefer or just discuss it more, uh, please like, subscribe, share this, and I'll see you next time. God bless.